Hey, good morning, UPBC. It's good to be with you today in this uh, now, uh, what I believe now is the fifth week of our series of our conversation entitled, Let My People Grow. Let My People Grow. We're talking about what does it mean for the church to actually do what it, what it does when it's healthy, when it is alive, it grows, it expands. More people are added to their day, uh, to their number daily. And uh, I want to ask you a question today that is a conversation that must happen if we're going to talk about growth and Christ's church being the church he envisioned, okay? And it has to do with this word, courage. Courage. How's the courage meter in your faith these days? I want to talk about faith and courage, something that must be talked about from this platform, and it stems from two passages and two men who knew a little something about courage. Listen to the first word from our chief pastor in the scriptures, the Apostle Paul. He says this in Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Paul embodied what he spoke of. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone. These words come from our early church father who himself was imprisoned, tortured, shipwrecked, ultimately died for his faith. He is the model of courage if we're going to talk about courage and faith. Because his faith led him to give his very life. Why is it important to talk about Paul and to remember his circumstances? Because we ourselves so often have a failure of nerve when it comes to the courage we're called to embody in our faith. Now let's look at our second passage, which is going to tie into this. The second passage is from John chapter 19, verse 38. Here's the context. Jesus has just been crucified. He cries out, it is finished, where he is atoned for the sins of the world on his shoulders. He exhaled and died, and nobody knew what to do next. His body is hanging on the cross when a man named Joseph of Arimathea stepped out of the shadows. Listen to this word. Joseph of Arimathea went to Pilate to ask for the body of Jesus in order to bury him. Now Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but what? Secretly, because he feared the Jews. Notice that little phrase. Was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jews. Let me ask you this question. When is it advisable... When is it wise, or maybe even important, for a Christ follower to carry out his or her faith in a secretive manner? When is it advisable, when is it wise, when is it maybe even important for a Christ follower to carry out his or her faith in a secretive manner? How beneath the radar can a true Christ follower live and still justifiably call himself or herself a Christian? I'm not talking about in places uh, around the world where Christianity is persecuted, such as Iran or Afghanistan or North Korea. Covert Christianity in those extreme situations might be the most strategic way to advance the gospel, to, to live out the church. Again, if you're in an environment that is hostile to the Christian faith. But this man, Joseph of Arimathea, was under no such extreme circumstances. The Bible tells us his covert Christianity, his decision to stay beneath the radar, was driven by nothing other than good old-fashioned fear. Fear. In other passages that tell us about Joseph, we learn that he was a good man. He was well-respected. In one passage, it refers to him being a wealthy man. 
In another passage, it's referred to him as being a member of an elite Jewish leadership body that in the U.S. culture would be analogous to the U.S. Senate or Supreme Court Justice. Joseph of Arimathea was an important man. He had a good reputation. He had a prestigious position. In short, Joseph had a lot to lose by identifying himself closely with this man, Jesus of Nazareth. So he didn't want to lose or put at risk his important role by being associated with Jesus. He made the calculated choice to keep his faith very private. For example, let's just play this out, what that would have looked like. Him living out as a disciple of Jesus, but doing it in a secretive manner. When Christ followers were gathering to meet for worship or Jesus' teaching, he would have had to stay away. It would blow his cover. If uh, his business friends were talking amongst themselves and bashing Jesus, he probably didn't step in and defend him. He probably just kept quiet and kept doing his job. Otherwise, he would blow his cover. When he saw injustice being done, the very kinds of oppression that Jesus said, we must stop at all costs. We must enter in. We must stop that from occurring. Joseph probably just turned his head and sidestepped the issue. He just had too much to lose. I'm sure that Joseph rationalized even his decision to be covert. I'm sure that Joseph spent lots of times justifying his decisions. But at the end of the day, the description given to him in the text we just read together was the true bottom line. He lived in fear of being associated with Jesus. He stayed in the shadows because of fear. Fear of what he might lose if he stepped up and strongly identified with Jesus Christ. So he chose cowering instead of courage. And he lived with the consequences of that every day. Can I do a quick timeout before we move on? You know what a timeout is? Timeout? You know what a timeout is? I'm going to take a timeout. I have always, I've said this so many times here at UPC, I've always been embarrassed by grandstanding, showboating, in-your-face Christians whose lives resemble poorly produced commercials, infomercials for God, right? That just, uh, I've always un- felt uncomfortable with people who maybe even walk around with their Bibles or stand outside of baseball or football games and, and are on loudspeakers. People who just, they're getting the message wrong. And they creep out normal people wherever they go, right? I think that overzealous Christians who aren't very discerning often do much more harm than good for the cause of Christ. We all know that, right? We all know that. But you know, in recent days, I've become as much or even more concerned about Joseph-type Christians. People who privately claim to bear the name of Jesus, but seldom, if ever, step up courageously to live the life that they are called to live. To live the life that Jesus has commanded them to live. Folks who gladly identify with Jesus in rooms like this on Sunday mornings, but then leave the safety of that sanctuary and come the real test on Monday morning when we all go back to the real world. There's a lot of Joseph types who decide to go stealth. Jesus one time in Matthew chapter 5 warned his followers to not go stealth. He said, I want you to burn brightly, so don't you dare take that burning light that I put inside your heart and put it under a bushel basket. Don't you put that under a basket. The world is meant to see the light in you. Don't you dare hide it. And Joseph was doing that. He kept his light under a bushel, and and he went stealth. This is a very real problem in the lives of Christ followers today. And friends, our church is not immune. The Joseph phenomena. For example, I talked with a UPPC member some time ago. This is years ago now. He owned and managed a medium-sized company. We were talking about life and work when he said something that bothered me. We had gone on mission trips before. We, we, we've known each other for a long time. It was a throwaway statement that he said, 
about how his faith would never encroach on his work. That he kept those separate. And I asked him how many of his 50 or so employees even knew that he was a Christian, to which he responded, oh, not many. Come to think of it, not any. And he didn't say that with any sort of shame. It seemed strange to me, so I asked him, why not any? And he proudly responded, I just don't like to be in people's faces about matters of faith. And that was his full explanation for totally going stealth and living a a covert Christian life from Monday to Friday. To avoid any possibility of overdoing it, you know, being in people's faces, he carefully put the light of his faith under a basket, under a cover, and seemed perfectly content to finish out his career that way. I was dumbfounded. I couldn't walk away from that conversation without reminding him that the one whose name he bears didn't commission us to to go see how few of feathers we could ruffle before we die, before we go home to heaven. Quite the contrary, and make no mistake about it, Jesus said, I want you to advance the kingdom. I want you who've committed your lives to me, we've been commissioned to go out and to bear fruit, as we learned just a couple weeks ago. We've been instructed to spread his love to any and all and to live by his imperatives, even if it costs us something. We've been commanded to proclaim his message of redemption and forgiveness and love and hope whenever, wherever, and however we can. And as I begin this series, we're supposed to be lying awake at night praying for and figuring out ways to positively influence the people in our lives, the relational influence we hold, the people in and around our lives to open themselves up to the love of Jesus Christ that will forever change their destiny. And I couldn't help sitting there with my friend who owned this business, I couldn't help but think what Paul would say if he was sitting there. Paul who was tortured, shipwrecked, died for his faith, what would Paul say if he was sitting there? Honestly, I think if Apostle Paul was was sitting there in that setting, he would say, man, you just don't get it. You just don't get it, do you? I don't think Paul would have any kind words. Now, I tried to be gentler, okay? But I also said to this friend before I ended the conversation, you know, one of Jesus' favorite sayings was, seek first the kingdom of God. And his last saying was, go into the world and let people know about my redemptive love. And when I ended that conversation, what stuck with me, this has always stuck with me. It's one of those moments in time that stayed with me. When I ended that conversation with that business guy, I got in my car and I started driving away. And a wave of realization came to me and I thought this. We're never going to change Tacoma with people like him. We're never going to advance the gospel with that sort of mentality. Are you feeling me? Are you? We're never going to change Tacoma with guys like this. It's just not going to happen. Covert Christians really don't help the cause at all. I thought, you know, that guy needs his bell rung. People who continue to fly beneath the radar all the time because of fear, they need to have their bell rung. Now, if you know what that means, bell rung, that's a football term. My freshman year, I came arrogantly into the PLU football program thinking I was going to earn my starting spot the first week until I ran headlong into John Ruby and his sway back uh, tackling style, and he rung my bell. We called him the bell ringer. <laughs> but he knocked me silly, and I got woken up, and I realized this is the big boys' territory of football. This isn't like high school. I got my bell rung. I got woken up. 
That's a term that helps us understand what has to happen when we are awakened to greater realities in our life. Because you know what? Someday, something has to happen to each of us where we will wake up and we'll flip from under the radar faith to courageous faith. Because you know what? That's precisely what happened to Joseph of Arimathea. We wouldn't be talking about Joseph of Arimathea. He would be lost in the landscape of people who did nothing courageous for the name of Jesus Christ if he had not stepped out of the shadows. Joseph of Arimathea got his bell rung one day so hard that he stepped out of the shadows, out of protecting his professional reputation, and he courageously walked into the court of Pontius Pilate, the one who had signed Jesus' execution orders, and at the risk of his own life, he wanted to take possession of the body of Jesus, the insurrectionist. And he wanted to give Jesus a proper burial. That day, Joseph of Arimathea identified himself publicly as a follower of Jesus Christ. He burned the bridge of fear and he went on record as one who was willing to pay the price to honor Jesus' name. And you're probably wondering, what was it that rang Joseph's bell? What did he see or hear or read or experience that had such a powerful effect on him? And I think I know the answer. I think I know what really rang Joseph's bell. It's that he saw a good man die. He saw a good man suffer. You see, Joseph of Arimathea was at the crucifixion. He saw the whole terrible thing. Watching someone die will always change you. It's a, it's a powerful experience. When I was 19 years old, I was following my parents, uh, driving behind my parents outside of Yakima and when uh, we were going up to just actually have a picnic up in the mountains when all of a sudden a car came onto the, the highway and was going too fast, came across two lanes and hit a truck in front of us. The truck careened off into the median and hit a light pole and immediately burst into flames. Now fortunately, I, I, I've... I uh, said this story before, I didn't mention it. There was a heroic uh, state trooper, and she jumped out of her car, and, and a number of us helped pull the two individuals in the truck out of the cab, and the state trooper heroically uh, handled the one side with flames, and I, I believe was burned very badly. But we pulled uh, the two people out, and then my parents went to attend to the other car, and I sat with one of the women uh, in that truck and was holding her hand. And I could tell she was injured. It was bad. And I'm pretty certain that she died right there as I was holding her hand. So it was a very powerful experience. I didn't know this woman. I never heard from her family or anything. We never heard anything about that afterwards. But I will never forget holding her hand as she passed away. It was a powerful memory. Joseph of Arimathea watched God's son die. Right before his eyes, he saw the whole thing up close and personal. He watched as the soldiers grabbed their hammers and their spikes and did what they were paid to do. And he heard Jesus scream in anguish as the spikes went into his hands and feet. And then he heard Jesus pray that unforgettable prayer. Do you remember? Do you remember the prayer? Father, forgive them. The people torturing me, forgive them. They know not what they do. Can you imagine hearing a man who's being tortured plead for grace for those doing the torturing? How much courage is required to take the, the nails and pray a prayer of blessing on those who are pounding them in? And Joseph watched as the one who had the power to heal the sick and calm the raging seas and the power to call down 10,000 angels to rescue him off that cross. Joseph stood there and watched Jesus set aside all that divine power to atone voluntarily for the sins of you and me. And Joseph saw it all. 
I think it was the courage of Jesus Christ that rang the bell in Joseph's brain. Jesus' courage to go to the cross. His courage to stay on the cross. The courage to finish the mission that God had assigned to him to finish. And I think near the end, Joseph heard Jesus' final cry. That final cry. Do you remember? Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And when Joseph saw Jesus exhale for the last time and watched his body go limp, I think something stirred so powerfully in him that he probably grit his teeth and he said under his breath, I will never cower again. I will never stay silent when God asks me to speak his words. I will never stay hidden when God wants me to share my faith. And I think right then Joseph said, my days of cowering undercover are over. No more covert Christianity. And to prove that to himself, as we read earlier, he puts his own life on the line by asking Pilate for the privilege of burying Jesus, thus forever. Thus forever being remembered for that courageous act. So now I want to speak to what I would imagine and I would gather is virtually every person in this room that can identify with Joseph at some point in your life either in the past, currently, or you're going to experience it in the future. I want to talk to those of us who are Joseph types. Are you with me? So often we can, we can just blend in as secret, covert Christians. We may even pride ourselves for never having made anyone feel uncomfortable about matters of faith. And what I want to remind you today is that a very good man died on your behalf. And he didn't die in the shadows. And he didn't die secretly. He died publicly. He died for everyone to see. He was humiliated in the public square. He suffered. He died. He was tortured. Publicly. And... What are we to do with that? I know you and I, we can say this about ourselves, but I know that you didn't have a front row seat like Joseph did. But the details have been recorded in the scriptures so that we can enter into the scene and join in and understand and meditate on the power of Jesus' courage to ring our bell. And 2,000 years ago, a very good man died for you and for me. He stepped out of the shadows at one point in his life to do what no other human could do. He identified himself as the long-awaited Messiah of God, fully God, fully human. And he took unbelievable amounts of heat in the public square for his declaration and his teaching and the imperatives that he gave to people. And he did so in a public manner. And then he died an agonizing and humiliating death in order to save your life and your soul. Something should stir in us like it did with Joseph. Something should stir inside of us to the point where we say, I don't want to be numbered among the cowardly. I don't want to be secretive about this anymore. I don't want to play it safe anymore. I don't want to keep all my options open and never take a stand. Instead to say I want to be associated with this man who publicly gave his life so that I can publicly share my life. That's what happens when you get your bell rung. When you decide you don't want to, you don't want to any longer be comfortable in the shadows when it comes to your faith, but to let other people know. And I want to just end with a few, just a few minutes, a few words to you as my friends. My final words to you as friends, because you are my friends. Don't go to your grave wondering what your life could or would or should have been like had you had a little courage. Joseph of Arimathea was in his 70s when this happened. 
I don't care how old you are. You are always available and ready to live a courageous faith life and to share your faith with others. That member I mentioned earlier who owned the business, who said, one day I'll maybe get to the courageous public life of faith, he died of a massive heart attack about two years after that conversation. He never had the opportunity to turn the corner. Don't go to your grave. If he was here today, he'd say, don't let the highest value in your life be just to play it safe and not ruffle feathers. Do what God's asking you to do. Find creative, winsome ways to share your faith with others and to do that winsomely. It was a tragic passing. He had so much ability to be able to share faith with others, and he lost it. Because none of us knows when we're going to be called to heaven. Don't go to your grave wondering what your life could have or would have or should have looked like if you'd had a little courage. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. Okay. Overtime. You ready for overtime? Okay. We have had timeouts. We've had bell rungs. We're at overtime. Okay. Overtime. Let me really, really go the next level here. I had a conversation with a UPPC member who was honest about his insecurities in inviting people to UPPC with him and opening up about his faith. He said, I just don't feel like I should do it because I'm a hypocrite. I'm not super religious, and so often I feel like I don't get it right. And I just wanted to hug him. I just, you're just such a, that's so honest. Thank you. Thank you for being honest with me. And he was, he was speaking of the kind of fear that sometimes we just aren't comfortable being honest about. Is that we don't feel like we're good examples sometimes of faith. Who am I to invite others in, right? Now here's the thing. Think about the people who were courageous enough to share faith with you. Was it their perfection that won you? Because I'll tell you this. My junior high youth pastor, Sean Rolls, was a, was a recently recovering drug addict. He still swore in our midst as a youth pastor. Wasn't perfect. Of course, we thought that was kind of cool. But, <laughs> yeah. The guy who first invited me to a Christian retreat was a man named Bubba who partied like John Belushi and had the mouth of a sailor. The Apostle Paul, the one who said he wasn't ashamed of the gospel, killed Christians before he came to faith. He hunted them down. He was part of, of kind of Pilate and, and the Jewish uh, you know, power brokers of that day. He was part of their agenda. God, let me tell you something. This is, this, is a, this is a key for us to hold. God doesn't call the perfect or the prepared. He prepares the call. If you're waiting to be perfect to finally live a faith of courage and invite others in, it's never going to happen. It's never going to happen. And if imperfect people weren't a barrier to you coming to faith or to church, then God can most certainly use you despite your imperfections. And we all should say amen to that. Amen. God doesn't need you to be perfect because your life is only pointing to the one who is. To the one who, who perfectly embodied the human life and the wisdom and the image and the, and the kingdom of God coming into this world. So I want to pray for us. And I want to just offer a prayer for the Josephs in the room. And that there's a place in time for each of us where we get our bell rung. And we come to grips with what Jesus has done for us so that we can now live a life of faith and witness and invitation towards others. And I want to ask you to join with me in that prayer. Would you open your hands? Lord, this room is so safe. This experience of worship and gathering and proclaiming your name is so safe. And we need your courage. Those of us who have our hands open right now, Lord, we need our bell rung. Would you call us to a faith that is open and visible and honest 
an invitation. Would you give us the courage of Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus and the disciples and all those who witnessed your crucifixion, your death, and then your resurrection? And we're emboldened with courage. We need that courage today, Lord Jesus. And so use us. Give us moments this week where we can see your invitation to share our faith with courage. Help us to see ways that we are living, living in the shadows with our faith. Where we operate out of fear rather than courage or faith to those who we work with or those that we live with or live around. Would you strike from us the lie that we need to have a more perfect faith in order to be an ambassador for you? Lord, may we have the courage that's required of us to share and live your good news in Tacoma and beyond. And for the sake of our city, Lord, we want everyone to know That the gospel has the power of God to bring salvation to everyone who believes. And all God's people said,